Okay, so welcome everybody to this ECS Precip event of uh, AGU 2020. And uh, yeah, this is our very first event with this uh, uh, precipitation subcommittee uh, of young scientists. So we are really excited and happy to see so many people attending. Um, so I just want to remind everyone that the, this event will be recorded and uh, so it will be available for people who could not attend at this time. Okay, let's get started. I'll share my screen with the first presentation. Of course, welcome. And uh, uh, here is the agenda. Um, we are gonna just introduce a little bit the precipitation technical committee with the chair of the committee, Viviana Maggioni. Then uh, we will present the subcommittee, the ECS Precip, uh, and each of the member will just share a couple of words about themselves. Uh, we will advertise our social media and the website that Diego is uh, is helping uh, um, taking care of. And then uh, I'll give some communications about the, this AGU fall meeting. And finally, we will have our five guests um, talking about themselves and their career and uh, their suggestions for young scientists. Uh, and then the main part will be the panel discussion, in which uh, all of you can ask questions or make comments uh, uh, about uh, about uh, career paths and the presentation you, you will uh, listen to. Finally, a uh, little survey and uh, some final comments. So there we go. Here is uh, um, Viviana and, uh, and Brenda, that is the um, deputy chair, of course. And, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you everybody for joining us today. It seems uh, to be a great success, uh, at least uh, by looking at the number of participants. Uh, uh, Lisa and Diego were very worried about the event, uh, so I'm very glad to see uh, the good turnout. I also want to thank our guests. I think it's great that you're here to discuss your career and share your experience uh, with our uh, early career scientists. Uh, I'm Viviana Maggioni. For those of you who don't know me, I work at George Mason University and I am currently serving as the chair of the Precipitation Technical Committee. I am lucky to have uh, Brenda Dolan with me as the deputy chair. Uh, she is saying hi right there from the mountains. Uh, she is at Colorado State University and uh, in a year from now, I think uh, she will be the new chair. Uh, let me also thank Pierre, who is on the call. He is the former chair and he has been uh, a great help uh, for me to understand how this works. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll be leading this uh, now. Uh, you can go to the next uh, uh, slide, Lisa. Uh, I just wanted to give you a very brief overview of who we are and what we do. Uh, again, for those of you who are not very familiar with the committee. In general, uh, well, first of all, we are one of 12 uh, technical committees uh, within the hydrology section at, at AGU. And our specific committee gathers expertise in hydrology, atmospheric science, uh, remote sensing, and mathematics uh, that really address any gap uh, in our knowledge and understanding of precipitation. Every year we update the list uh, of uh, hot topics uh, and research questions uh, that we are seeking. Uh, and here you see uh, the current ones. Uh, so we are specifically looking at process changes at convective and orographic scales, but also trying to find consistent observations uh, to accurately estimate pred and predict um, precipitation on a global scale at uh, resolutions uh, that are both spatial and, and temporal resolutions that are high enough for any applications uh, that uh, we may uh, be interested in. Snowfall, as some of you or most of you probably know, uh, is one of the um, ongoing challenges uh, in precipitation estimation, and that's why you see it uh, listed there. 
And then last but not least, uh, we're trying to close the water balance uh, from different point of view, not just uh, from uh, the hardware catchment, but also to the continental scale. Um, if you can click, Lisa. We are currently have about 31 members, and uh, I was actually pleased uh, to see that we represent 25 organizations from nine different countries. Uh, recently, and you can click, yeah, uh, we created three subcommittees. One is in charge of the phone meeting organization. Uh, that means basically looking at uh, the proposals for sections that uh, were submitted and uh, proposed mergers. We have uh, one subcommittee that is in charge of award nominations. As uh, you probably know, uh, every year AGU award the scientists uh, in uh, for you know, different um, stages of their career and uh, in, for different uh, um, topics, I would say, uh, and uh, we have been uh, pretty lucky uh, and uh, proactive as well in the past. And then last but not least, we have our early career and student subcommittee who is really leading this event today. Um, and uh, I have to say that they have been amazing with uh, social media and uh, trying to really bring us together and, and see how you know we can all help each other. So Lisa. I'm done. If you have questions, uh, feel free to email me at any point. Uh, uh, you can even ask questions in the chat if you want. And if you're interested in participating in the AGU Precipitation Technical Committee and you're not uh, part of it yet, same thing. Just let us know. Great. Thank you, Viviana. And uh, then since you had so nice words for the technical uh, uh, the ACS Precip uh, part of the technical committee, I'm going to introduce it. So I'm going to share again. Let's see all this share, not share, share, not share. Back. Okay. So hope you can see it. This is, these are the very nice faces of our subcommittee. And uh, so I can introduce myself since I haven't done it yet. I'm Lisa Milani. I'm the chair of this uh, uh, subcommittee. Um, I'm originally from Rovigo, a little town in the north of Italy, in between Venice and Bologna. And uh, I, all my studying career was at the University of Ferrara, that is very close to Rovigo, like 30 minutes or so. Uh, my current position is I'm an assistant research scientist for uh, University of Maryland. Uh, at, uh, at ASIC, the Earth System Science Interdisciplinary Center in College Park. But my office is uh, at NASA Goddard, uh, so the Goddard Space Flight Center that is in Greenbelt, uh, uh, Maryland. Um, I'm a member of the AGU Precipitation Technical Committee since 2018 and uh, chair of the new subcommittee since, uh, since it's born this year. Uh, very briefly, um, my career, um, how I got there, I graduated in astrophysics, so my bachelor and master degrees were in astrophysics, and then I started studying atmospheric physics uh, with my PhD, and actually I really loved it, and I wish I, I could do atmospheric physics uh, even before the PhD, but anyway, all the experiences are good. Uh, I got my first uh, postdoc at University of Ferrara, and then I moved to Rome um, for a postdoc at the, at the National Research Council, uh, the Institute for Atmospheric Science and Climate, ISAC uh, CNR. And then I got um, my first experience uh, in, the, in the US, uh, a honorary fellowship at the Space Science and Engineering Center in Madison, Wisconsin. And then uh, I went back to Italy again and uh, was waiting to, to see if I could find something else to work on uh, in, the, in the research field. Um, and while I was waiting, I started teaching uh, at high school. So maths, physics, uh, computer science, stuff like that is a very good experience, actually. Um, then I got another postdoc again at CNR uh, ISAC in Bologna this time. 
And then I finally moved to the US in 2017, at the end of 2017, as an assistant researcher at Michigan Tech um, in Michigan, both in Michigan, um, where actually I started. Uh, so actually, I started uh, my 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 very loved research in uh, research topic that like is uh, snowfall while I was in Rome, and then uh, and then really I started it uh, in uh, in medicine. So snowfall is uh, is uh, my love topic. Uh, I do retrieval from active and passive satellite sensor, um, specifically from clouds, uh, GPM, uh, but also from the ground. Here is a, a picture of uh, of myself while I was deploying a pluvius in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan two years ago for a GPM uh, ground validation campaign. And uh, my favorite topic is the shallow convective snow that is also known as lake effect snow over some areas like the US Great Lakes. So yeah, if you need to collaborate about snow, I'm your person. <laughs> and now is uh, Noah. Go ahead, Noah. Hello, um, so my name is Noah Brown and um, I am the co-chair of the ECF precip, uh, ECS Precip Subcommittee um, with Lisa. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I was born actually in Vancouver, BC, Canada, a eh? um, little Canadian there and um, moved to Colorado when I was 16, uh, did my bachelor's there. Um, and then I actually spent um, two, a little over two years working in the private sector at a weather software company. Um, and then I realized that I wanted to go back to school. So I made my way to the University of Oklahoma here um, where I got my master's in meteorology back in 2019. And I'm currently um, doing my PhD here at OU, uh, about a year and a half, two years left um, in that. So my main research this, um, includes ground and space-borne radar retrievals um, in, in tropical cyclones, um, looking at cloud microphysics, and especially excessive precipitation. Um, so large part of, um, of my work, it actually involves field work. So we were out in Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Sally uh, this past year collecting mobile radar data. There's a picture of us on the bottom right. Um, and yeah, actually I've been working so far, um, for the past month, um, which has been a, a unique challenge and something I've actually really enjoyed and loved. Um, so that's enough about me. I got outside of work. I just enjoy being outside, hiking, um, cooking, um, you know, traveling and sports as well. So it's good to be here and I'm glad to see all your, all of your faces. Thanks, Noah. Next is Yagmur. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Yagmur Uh, Originally from Ankara, I did my BS and master from Middle East Technical University. I've got my PhD from University of Connecticut with uh, Manos, and currently I'm working with Pierre uh, as a postdoc, a research assistant scientist, um, affiliated in Advanced Radar Research Center here in University of Oklahoma. I started uh, being a student member in this precipitation technical committee. Uh, since 2015, when I was done with my PhD, now I'm a regular member, and I recommend uh, all PhD students or master students to go through the same uh, path that I did, so that you will have an understanding of what is happening with the technical community, and um, you can get involved. Uh, it's a great opportunity, I think. Uh, my career, in summary, is that I graduated from a geological engineering with a focus for uh, on hydrogeology. I uh, have done um, in my masters. I, did, uh, I conducted uh, evaluation of satellite precipitation products and application of these products to physically based distributed hydrogen model over complex terrain. The hydrogen model we used were Maxi and Mike 11. And during my PhD, I've done an evaluation, characterization, and modeling of uncertainties of the satellite based precipitation product again uh, over complex terrain. And right now, I'm working on multiple things. I'm working on x band dual polarization radar retrievals, um, again, over complex terrain. So the, um, the common ground is uh, over mountains, or graphic precipitation, and complex terrain. I'm also doing characterization, evaluation, and again, modeling of the satellite-based precipitation products. Uh, and, uh, but most importantly, right now, what I'm working on is finding in, um, uh, environmental parameters that can characterize the 
geographic precipitation uh, over complex terrain so that we can uh, characterize this precipitation better uh, for the satellite based precipitation products. Um, and that's well been said. So, my favorite topic is, as you can tell, it's complex terrain parameter characterization, uh, such as organic lifting and moisture flux. Um, if you have any questions or you would like to collaborate related to the precipitation and complex terrain, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Yagmur. Here we have Diego. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Diego Serrai, and uh, for the AGU Technical Committee, I'm responsible for the website. So if you have any questions about the AGU website, if you would like to add anything to the website or any additional links or, or any ideas that you would like to have for the website, I'm here and feel free to contact me. Uh, I am assistant professor at the University of Connecticut and manager of the Everest Energy Center. We are a center that studies the electric grid uh, renewable integration and also uh, how extreme events uh, create damages and affect the reliability and resilience of the electric grid. I graduated in physics uh, because I wanted to study to, to understand how all the knowledge that we have now uh, came from the past and study what the past philosophers and also the past scientists did and studied and what they knew. So I wanted to start from the basis, despite I always like meteorology and natural science. Later, I moved to meteorology, so physics of the air system and environmental engineering now. So the next step is the impact of meteorology and extreme events on the infrastructure. That is what I'm doing now. Uh, right now, I am uh, I'm doing research on extreme weather events. Uh, we are not studying tornadoes because yeah, for, for many reasons, and we, we, we cannot predict the impact of those on the electric grid right now, but we are studying hurricanes, snow and ice storms mostly, and how the wet or dry snow affects the reliability and resilience of the infrastructure. Um, I am the team leader of the Autos Prediction Model. We are working on a model for wildfire ignition on tree disturbances and how uh, trees affect the, the reliability and resilience of the infrastructure. And on more recently also on renewable energy and uh, renewable energy sources integration. Uh, thank you very much. I think I, we can move to the next. Awesome. Thank you. Yeonjin. Hello, everyone. I'm Yeonjin. Um, I'm originally from South Korea. And I did my master's in Korea and oh, undergraduate degree. I got it in Korea, but then I moved to um, Colorado and I just got my PhD yesterday. I defend, I had a defense yesterday. So I might look a little tired right now, but <laughs> I'm happy. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> and I'll be working as a postdoc at CIR and Fort Collins. Um, I actually, my undergraduate degree was in environmental science, but then I had an opportunity to study in France and there I studied biology. But then after I got back to Korea, I was working on some wildfire and climate stuff. And that, that's how I got into, uh, got interested in weather and climate system. And that's why I studied atmospheric science in my master's and PhD degrees. And my research interests are mostly working with the GO-16 satellite data. So my th dissertation was about using GO-16 to detect convection and then estimating oh. heating and eventually initiating convection using the latent heating. And I did some work using machine learning methods um, to detect convection as well. And uh, uh, as a postdoc, I'll be working on applying machine learning in data simulation for short time forecast models. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Hisham. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. So my name is Hisham Dardiri. I'm originally from Egypt, from Alexandria city in the north of Egypt. Uh, I got my bachelor from Alexandria University in Egypt, and then I moved here to US, uh, where I got my master's from University of Louisiana. Um, currently, I'm PhD and candidate at the University of Washington, Seattle, and I've been serving for the AGU Precipitation TC since 2018. So. 
my career in brief it's, it's mostly in the graduate school so after I graduated with my bachelor i i joined the civil engineering department in the university of louisiana working more in reader precipitation and uh, i also was involved in some systems engineering experience over there and then i went back to egypt where was, uh, i worked at the alexander university as assistant lecturer teaching different courses in water resources something that i, I love and then uh, I came back here to University of Washington for my PhD and more involved in satellite precipitation. I've also have some experience in turning at the PNL last two summers. And now I'm looking for my next step, which probably might be postdoc. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, part of this committee and uh, get involved in this event so I can learn more about the experience of the, the guest speakers and uh, to maybe decide for my future career. Uh, my research enters is basically on the hydroclimatic streams and more in the using remote sensing observations for uh, detecting the extreme precipitation, how, how this can impact the water system dynamics. Yeah, that's everything. Thank nice. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Rick? Rick, uh, sorry. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Just trying to unmute myself. There we go. Um, hi, I'm Rick. Um, I've been on the technical committee since 2018 as a student member. Um, I grew up mostly in the southeast U.S., kind of lived a bunch of places and got my bachelor's degree at Santa Clara University, which is in California. Um, like Lisa, I actually had a brief detour where I taught um, high school math and, and physics and then um, came to Colorado State University where I am right now to do atmospheric science. Um, and so I'm in probably the last year of my PhD now. Um, and I've worked uh, pretty closely on the Tempest D CubeSat project, if anyone um, is familiar with that or has questions about that. I'm kind of the algorithm lead for that. And now my work has turned mostly to um, precipitation retrievals um, from GPM and CloudSat and kind of looking at the high latitude areas and how we can improve retrievals in those in those areas. So that's that's it for me. Nice, thanks. And last is Shruti. I don't think she's online. Um, she said she had to travel actually today. So uh, briefly, she's uh, a member of the committee since uh, 2020, and uh, she works on understanding precipitation processes and quantification using geostationary satellite observations, known as uh, Go Gozar series. She's from India, and she got her uh, degrees in uh, at the Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai, in Bom Bombay, India. And uh, her current posi position is a postdoctoral research associate at the Cooperative Institute for Mesoscale uh, Meteorological Studies at Norman, Oklahoma. Sorry, I cannot tell more about her, but I think um, I think this is a, a good uh, uh, overview. Um, as uh, and everybody else said, you can contact us if you want to. Um, you know, keep in touch, or you have questions. All our emails are on the on uh, on our website uh, uh, that Diego is going to talk about in a little bit. All right, so let's go actually to the websites and social media. There we go, Diego. Yes. So basically, over over the past few years. We so we already had a website, but we renewed it, and now it is hosted on the AGU official website. Before it was a website that was separate. So this is the link to our website. Uh, we have we created a Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, yeah, going to the next slide, we we can see uh, the website right now. So. In our website, we advertise our events. Uh, in the first part, for example, the, there was today's event, uh, the awards. Right now, uh, I would like to remind that it's still open the opportunity for students. So the deadline is today. 
for um, for getting an award of one hundred dollar, and there are five different awards for students who participate and present uh, a poster uh, at AGU, a poster or an oral presentation at AGU. So uh, the students, please uh, have a look at the website and and click there, apply, and you have the chance to win one hundred dollar, or and you you will be evaluated. Uh, based on your presentation. Um, below there is our mission on the website, uh, the links to our social media, uh, additional li useful links to, for example, NASA uh, Global Hydrology Resource Center, GPM, and other links that you can find there. Those are useful. And here is where I ask for your input. Please email me with additional links, additional missions, that you would like to include in the website. Uh, and below, uh, there are the AGU sessions. Uh, it is much longer. Here is just the first part. If you scroll down on the website, there are all the different sessions related to precipitation. Uh, and the past sessions on the right at AGU 2019, and I think we have also 2018, and I remember it falls 2017 as well. Uh, basically, they are organized here. You can click, and that will take you to to the to the um, to the AGU website where you can see the program and everything else. Uh, the next slide is about social media. So, as we mentioned, we increased our presence on social media. That actually before was there was nothing. Uh, so we have Facebook. On Facebook, we advertise the awards talk about the events, something similar to the website, but we, we are able to reach a much higher number of people and they can share uh, uh, and, uh, and, and add even more people to, to our web page and uh, help us having even more visibility. We can also share relevant research. And we, we have also a group on Facebook uh, in which the, the, there is, it is a restricted group. So if you, if you would like to have access, you can but that is closed and we can talk about specific topics that we, we may want to discuss about precipitation. We have a Twitter page and we have also Instagram. Uh, Lisa, would you like to add anything more about the group? Yeah, so this group is actually a more informal place uh, where we would like you know, to share ideas or comments or whatever you feel like. While the page itself is more, you know, official, where we post uh, events or activities that um, that we organize or other uh, connected uh, groups uh, organize, uh, and we can adver advertise also that. So I, I would encourage you to join the group uh, as well because it's a good informal place to to be connected with uh, with other uh, with, with your peers. All right. Thank you, Diego. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, now I have just, I keep sharing, so it's just easier. Uh, there we go. Just a couple of announcements. Um, so I remember my very first uh, um, conference, actually, few first, a few conferences at the beginning. I was so busy finding out the, you know, the, the sessions to follow, which one to go, which one to skip, etc. But I've never thought about town halls that are actually a nice, uh, a nice opportunity to, uh, to be updated on, uh, on uh, programs, missions, or, you know, have uh, information on a broad, uh, um, in a very broad spectrum. So here are just three uh, town hall that I would like to advertise. There is the NASA weather and atmospheric dynamics focus area town hall tomorrow uh, at, at four. This is all specific time, so do your math. <laughs> uh, and then there are two very interesting, uh, since this is, you know, uh, uh, students and early careers event, I want to advertise the um, the other two event, big events of the uh, early careers, uh, navigating an academic career and navigating a non-academic research career. Uh, both are hosted the 4th of December, uh, one at 10.30 and the other at 4. 
uh, 4 p.m. Um, Pacific time. So just give a look, and uh, if you can attend that, I think it could, it could be a good, uh, uh, very interesting. I mean, for for us, for early career people. Then, uh, yeah, this is the last day, as Diego said, for applying for the Precipitation Student Award. We have these five hundred dollars awards for the best oral poster or lightning presentation uh, on a precipitation topic. So it must be on a on one of the precipitation sessions, and uh, the application the application is available on the website. So just click fill the form, and you'll be in for be judged. Uh, finally, this is my favorite event actually, the precipitation happy hour. <laughs> And uh, uh, so since uh, we are not having our beer during the poster sessions this year, we, we decided to do um, a precipitation happy hour every day, every weekday from December 7th to the 18th uh, at 1.30 Pacific time. Again, do your math. We will be online for half an hour. Um, all the precipitation folks are uh, invited. Uh, and this is once we just a virtual meet. Uh, so we know that virtual meetings are impersonal and we want to make uh, real connections. So that's why we want to see your faces and just, uh, you know, say hi. Um, the, the meeting link will be shared uh, on the precipitation technical committee website. So just go there and, and click uh, on the link that you'll find. We just post the link. Uh, um, late like at the last minute to avoid you know scams and issues with uh, with connections uh but we will advertise it also on the on our um, social media so yeah bring your drink snacks a smile stop by for discussing that weird presentation talk about weather complain about how warm the beer is at AGU this year or just to say hi And after that, I guess we are finally to our main part, that is our guests. So I really want to thank, really thank uh, uh, our five guests to uh, be available and willing to share um, their experiences to young scientists. It's really important to see senior people that really care about youngest ones. So thank you very much. And uh, we will start to see how they became a scientist from George. And George, I'm going to assign you the. Uh, click. There we go. You there should. we go. OK, thank you. Um, thank everyone for stopping by. And uh, it's a little bit shocking to be of uh, considered of an age where I, I'm the old guy. <laughs> um, so, this is a picture of me at the, the NASA Hyperwall. If you were at AGU, this is like the place to be during break because NASA would be showing the Hyperwall, uh, you know, great presentations. As it is, we're showing Hyperwall presentations, uh, which are recorded. Now, let's see. Click. There we go. Um, whoops. Can I unclick? I guess go back with the uh, arrow. I can do it. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Um, this is just so I don't forget my all the hats that I'm supposed to wear. Uh, I'm at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, which is in Greenbelt, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. And I wear hats which are labeled the GPM Deputy Project Scientist. Um, I'm the lead for the GPM multi-satellite working group, which means I'm guilty of the iMERGE uh, data set and prior to that, the TMPA data set. Along the same lines, also, I have my hand in the GPCP, uh, Global Precipitation Data Set. And I have been the chief of the Mesoscale Atmospheric Processes Lab for the last almost two years now. Okay, now I can click. Click. There we go. Um, so here's my graphical bio sketch. Uh, I I got into weather because it, I think it's cool, it's relevant, 
And it also helps that it's funded. Uh, <laughs> some other science fields can't say that so well. And this is for, you know, you already know this because you're further along, but when I talk to undergraduates, I point out that it takes a lot of math and science, a lot of computer skills. It also takes English skills, and perhaps you haven't quite figured that part out yet, but you do a great deal of writing, and, and you need to do good writing, the better, you know, writing is, the, the more likely your audience is to understand what you're doing. So I started out in Ashland, Ohio, North Central Ohio, Ashland County, went to little High school called Mapleton had 96 students in my graduating class, but here I am working for NASA. After that, I went to, wow, the colors are really terrible. I went to Ohio State and I measure, majored in uh, uh, physics, Diego. <laughs> and uh, I did that partly because at the time Ohio State didn't really have a meteorology program, but also because it just you know, you, a really strong math background was was important. I knew that. And yeah, you get that in physics, right? <laughs> uh, while I was there, I had the chance to spend a summer at NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, which is another not academic uh, research institute. And so I, I saw meteorology being done in hiking shorts and, and boots first. So I know that, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do science. Um, subsequently, I was a UCAR fellow. I don't think those exist anymore. And so I was there for three more summers. While I was going to graduate school at MIT. Um, my advisor was uh, Dave Randall, now at Colorado State. And when he left, then uh, Fred Sanders became my academic advisor. <clears throat> I got a degree in what you would recognize as mesoscale and synoptic. I like to say to people that when I graduated, this specialty in which I now work did not exist. Uh, this is 1982. Um, satellite meteorology for precipitation was in an infancy. I then went to University of Maryland, College Park. I spent six and a half years in the meteorology department, and then I shifted over to Goddard. Um, 24 years as a contractor and now the last uh, seven years as civil service. Do, do, do. So as part of this, uh, you know, jobs and, and all that kind of stuff, here's a quick tour around Goddard. I should say Goddard is one of seven NASA centers in the United States. Um, besides Goddard, the things that we do are also done at JPL, Marshall, um, Langley Research Center to a lesser extent. Goddard is in suburban Maryland, uh, right outside Washington, D.C. Uh, it also includes the Wallet Flight Facility and the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which respectively are on the coast in Virginia and in uh, New York City. We have a security perimeter, which means you can't just stop by and visit me. You actually have to have an appointment. Uh, of course, right now, <laughs> nobody's at, well, very few people are there. We do mostly the other NASA stuff that you don't hear so much about at Goddard. Earth science, space science, like I said, it's one of seven centers. Oops. Ah, clicked again. Sorry, Lisa, I clicked twice. There we go. There we go. Okay, thank you. So Goddard has about 11,000 people on site. About half of them are civil servants, and then the rest are either uh, university personnel like Lisa or private contractors, which is what I was for 24 years. If you're, on, if you're a contractor, typically that means you're on a support contract which lasts for about five years, then has to be recompeted if it's ongoing, and a lot of them are. Um, if a new company happens to win that contract, the so-called incumbent employees uh, generally get a higher offer unless the government is using this as an opportunity to go in a different direction uh, on their research or activities. The actual funding for these individual positions in the uh, contract are um, proposal driven. It's either flight projects, for example, GPM, which I'm now part of, or the so-called ROSES, which is a research opportunities space and earth science. They, and so um, roses are open to um, university folks too, and we, you know, we all sort of compete together. 
the flight projects are tend to be driven by the um, the centers, at least the big ones. Anything else, someone? I think that's okay. So more specifically, Earth science. It's about only 30% civil service, which means 70% of the workforce is either university, which tends to be postdocs and research scientists, mostly PhDs, and contract folks who tend to do what tends to be called support, mostly masters and bachelors people. <clears throat> the bad news about this is that there is no unified job board. You can't simply look on a website and say, oh, I want to work at Goddard. Um, the only thing you can find is the individual companies, including the U.S. government is a company. <laughs> They've got a site and it's jobs at Goddard. But if you want to work for any of the other organizations, you basically have to find the organizations and look for um, um, who supports them. And so in particular, you know, in sort of these lighter colors down through the listings, I'm in 612, which is MAPL. Um, we have a, a prime support contractor, but we then we also have some other specialty subcontractors and, uh, and then the university personnel. One of the ways that you can come in as a university person is with a NASA postdoc position, NPP. Um, and there are, you know, it's pretty competitive. Uh, so on the one hand, there's there are opportunities, but on the other hand, it's a bit difficult to find. The other thing about this I want to make sure you understand is have very specific needs. Typically, we don't just put out a position description for somebody that just studies precipitation. We're going to be looking for, say, somebody who studies the crystal structure of snowflakes and how you can model those in radiative transfer, finite something or other models. Um, and so it, the, it's a little bit challenging both for you as a person who wants to come in perhaps, and as for us looking for the per specialty to get the right fit. Um, since I, since I mentioned the data sets, I thought I would just show you. Um, it turns out I've been at this for a fairly long time. The AGPI first came up in the mid-1990s, and it gave us opportunities to grow as the field of satellite precipitation estimation grew. And so now we have uh, different parts of my group have responsibility for parts of the GPCP, as well as uh, most of the iMERGE and uh, before that, the, the trim. Oops. That click. Okay. Or is that the last one? Yeah, maybe so. So um, that's a short tour around what I did. Um, the last thing I want to say is, what comes next? The good news is we in precipitation, which I guess is sort of all of us, have not worked ourselves out of a job yet. There are some really major issues going on. I've actually heard some people already mention that they're interested in things like high latitude, um, using working on um, um, complex terrain issues. There are you know sub monthly gauge analysis stuff and and so on. I've got a whole list here, and I think at least you're probably going to post these so you people can go back and look at their leisure. Error estimation. If you want a hard problem, I've got one for you. Error estimation. Uh, so I'm just going to stop with that and uh, get off the stage. Thank you, George. Thank you. So. Here I'll on animation. Here is Ralph. Uh, let me assign you. Oops. There we go. Okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Lisa and everybody for organizing this. Uh, it's a um, good opportunity, as George mentioned. It's kind of we're at this stage of our career where uh, uh, it's, it's sort of gone very fast. 
Um, so here to shed a little light for s some of the newer scientists. So let's see, page down. Not quite. Lisa, could you just advance it? Maybe it's just easier. All right, so a little bit about myself. I work for NOAA, NESDIS, um, and we have a small group uh, called Satellite Climate Studies Branch, and we're co-located with the Cooperative Institute um, for Satellite Earth System Studies, which is part of the University of Maryland, ESSEC, where Lisa resides. Um, a lot of acronyms. Uh, a little bit about myself. I grew up in northern New Jersey, big New York Yankee fan. Uh, you know, uh, undergraduate degree at Rutgers, uh, meteorology at like Diego, I'm a real weather weenie. And here looking at my weather station, gusts over 30 miles an hour all day long here. Um, then I got a master's um, at the University of Maryland. I focus on infrared radiative transfer. Then went right into working, um, as sort of George alluded to, um, a lot of private sector jobs. They used to be called Beltway Bandits. They, a lot of these little companies pop up and get absorbed by bigger companies and so forth. Um, did that for seven years. Got involved with uh, microwave remote sensing um, and then uh, position opened up at NESDIS. Uh, joined them in 91. It was one of these, you know, I didn't even change desks when I got this job. Um, and uh, and then uh, we had a new branch that was formed at the University of Maryland Satellite Climate Studies branch. And so I've been in charge of that group of five scientists uh, for about the last 15 years. Um, I like being outdoors, a little rainbow shot there from, um, we go to the Outer Banks in North Carolina a lot uh, and like being, being outdoors uh, and doing certain things. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so working for NOAA, as I mentioned, there's tons of acronyms. So if you don't like acronyms, maybe it's not the place for you. But um, NOAA is pretty diverse. Uh, it's, it's ocean and atmospheres, right? It, and, and there's different um, arms of NOAA. Uh, it makes it a little complicated at times, but it covers weather, climate, oceans, fisheries, satellites, and, and research. Uh, it, it, one, one nice thing about NOAA, it's an operational agency, so there are people um, and there's things that have to go on every hour of every day of every, you know, uh, in the year. So there's a lot of re uh, relevance to the safety, well-being of the public. Uh, I got a typo there. So example, like, you know, probably most of you know, but, you know, the radar and satellite data you see on TV really comes from NOAA. And part of our job is to make sure that it's reliable and accurate. Um, so, you know, I got some graphics here. These are like the, the billion dollar disasters over the years. And these are the things that NOAA is involved with, um, you know, trying to, to, to improve uh, lead times on these forecasts and so forth. You know, but, the, but there are a lot of research components. I noted some of these that, that, that um, you all are probably interested in. Um, you know, so hydrology, forecast models, hurricanes, new technologies. And one of the things that I've done uh, that we try to do at NOAA is to take advantage of the new things that, uh, say, NASA develops and, you know, GPM. And part of what I've done has been a bit of a liaison between NOAA and NASA on, on some of these um, products and algorithms that George described. Uh, it's a casual environment. Unless you, unless you want to get into the, the, the headquarters type of work. Um, it's very rewarding. Uh, there, there's all sorts of opportunities. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. And as George mentioned, most people start as a contractor or, or postdoc at one of our CIs. I have a map there. And, uh, you know, of several of the people who already spoke are, are affiliated with these um, as it is. So that's a lot of people when they get out of school to try to get, you know, uh, good opportunities to work at one of these institutes. And then, you know, if, if you perform well, when the right time comes, um, you know, you might be able to get into the NOAA environment. That's sort of kind of how, how it works. Next slide. I think I'm almost done. Um, at least if you could advance. All right. So what I've done, um, I've worked mostly with these passive microwave sensors and developed different algorithms to retrieve uh, all sorts of products, which is in that one graphic there. Um, 
And uh, a lot of things that I've done are still running today at NOAA um, or at, at Fleet Numerical or even at NASA. I think I think finally my, some of my old land rain algorithms are sort of sort of uh, past their prime and, and now been replaced by by better approaches. Um, you know, so I've gotten you know had opportunities to publish a lot of papers. Got was involved with a lot of professional opportunity. Um, uh, societies, opportunities like the AMS, National Weather Association, AGU, a lot of good good uh, linkages with international um, groups like the International Participation Working Group, Viviana is one of the current co-chairs. Um, I really enjoyed the collaborations and, and mentoring, especially uh, last several years of, of my career. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as my career has evolved and I've you know, been around long enough. I've I've uh, gotten involved with more strategic planning, uh, with you know looking at future future things. And and I think one of the things I really enjoyed are just these lifelong friendships that I've developed. I've got these photos here. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think George is in this one here. Or the black it's black and white. It's from the early nineties. It, it should be black and white. I don't I don't know if they had color photographs back then or not. But these were a lot of the early validation studies that went on with a lot of the techniques. And we all got together and got in, in a room and, and, and looked at uh, printouts and, and tables of data, different metrics about which techniques work the best. And, and a lot of us, when we still get together, we still still have fond memories of, of doing a lot of this, this work. Um, next slide, which is my last one. So, so just I, I jotted some ideas down just for, for those, you know, uh, who are in school and looking to go forward. <clears throat> so working at NOAA are these affiliates, which are which are big arms of our um, scientists. Uh, you really be, you know, at the forefront of, you know, weather and climate, hydrology, you know, things that are will be used every day uh, in operations. Uh, I noted a few things that I thought were important for hydrology. There, we have the National Water Center in Tuscaloosa, a um, lot going on there, and, and, and of course, uh, you know, cloud computing, machine learning, AI are all emerging sort of priority areas. Um, if you want, you know, if you want to work at NES, you want to work with the satellites that I do. You know, we're really looking for for ways to do things differently. Uh, we, we are sort of an older organization, and, and and we need to do things a little bit out of the box, and that's where like things like cloud computing. And such are coming about, and and of course, then we're we're now in the planning for our next generation of satellites, uh, and that that may include a lot of uh, private public partnerships like these small sats, you know, public uh, or, or state in situ networks, and so forth. And just you know, I mean, in, you know, the best way to succeed, you know, you don't always have to be the the smartest in what you do. You just you know, you need to just sort of be honest and. Work hard, uh, you know. Collaborate. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to raise your hand, but also be realistic uh, in what you say you can do. I think that's 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 an important aspect. And I, I have my email there. If anybody you know ever wants to contact me, I'd be glad to, uh, to to answer some questions. Thanks a lot. That's it. So I think Effie wants to share her screen. You're muted. Yeah, should I or it works fine? I let me share it. How can I do that? <laughs> There's the share button sure. underneath. Okay, sure. Okay. Can you see it? Perfect. Okay. Ahead. Great. So, th thank you very much uh, for everything you do for AGU and the community, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I hope we were in the same room, but let's plan to get in the same room next year, hopefully in a, uh, a real AGU meeting. I have the title, The Life, a Life in Science. Let me see how I can. A Life in Science, A Few Lessons Learned. And this is the same title of a talk that I gave, as you said, at the bottom in 2018 at the University of Illinois in a Women in Science and Engineering meeting. So the joke that I made at that time was if Richard Feynman wrote a whole book of a life in science, 
and Steve Hawkins and Albert Einstein and the Nobel laureate um, uh, Sidney Brenner, then it's a good enough title for me. <laughs> But apart from the joke, the seriousness of that is that I really believe uh, that it is life in science, that our personal life and technical professional lives interact, feedback with each other and make us who we are. So if I reflect back in my 63 years of age, again, not only professional, but personal experiences, um, the first thing I would say is that I'm lucky. But of course, as Einstein says, luck favors the prepared one, but still I consider myself lucky. I have always been very determined. I remember from very early age, if I set my mind to something, I would work for that to make it happen. I never took no for an answer, and I mean that too. Um, within a reason, if I believe that something was the right thing to do, I would go for it and I would ask how to do it. Um, and not uh, take an answer that no, it cannot be done. I work hard and I expect the others to do so and my group knows that. I always blend it seemingly work and family because you have to, it's a life in science. I never said no to our kids and my students because I want them to explore everything that is out there and not be constrained. I sincerely care about the young people and science is a way of, a way of life for me and I believe it is Generally. So I was born and grew in a small city in uh, Greece, Levadia. Uh, you see here in the picture, it is a, a, a small town. Uh, at that time, it was like 9,000 people, close to the mountain. Uh, that was the uh, plaza with the single movie theater and the coffee shops where we would just gather. Um, then uh, Greece has a tradition in um, advancing and, um, you know, valuing the education. So at the age of 13, I was asked, what do I want to study? And this is because then you have to prepare very hard for the entrance examination. And I said an engineer, that meant that they had to move me from the girls' high school to the boys' high school, because there is where the math and science was done. Uh, we were seven girls and 35 boys for three years. And I had to work very hard. There are lots of stories I can say, but uh, the one thing that I would say is that um, the math professor in that boys' high school did not believe that girls can do math. Uh, that professor was convinced otherwise. I ended up being his best student, and he was my mentor. So the take-home message is prove yourself with hard, hard work, not with complaints or anything else, just hard work. I entered the National Technical University of Athens in 74, and this was a five-year program, very intense. Um, I came, so I started after I graduated in the Ministry of Public Works and was very boring. In 1980, I visited the US, visited my boyfriend at that time, 40 years later, you know, my husband of 40 years. Uh, but at that time I came with a tourist visa. I did not, did not in, intend to stay, but within the tourist visa uh, period of three months, I, I enrolled in English classes, which I didn't know English and knew French. I took the GRE, the TOEFL, and I was accepted at the University of Florida, where I started my PhD degree. I was very fortunate that I not only was accepted by my advisors, who are unknown at all, at the AGO community, uh, because they were doing a storm shear design, um, so uh, Wayne Huber and Jim Heaney, and they gave me complete freedom. They paid me complete freedom to do what I wanted to do, which I pursued precipitation research. If I ever asked them, am I in the right direction? They would tell me, you know better than us, do whatever you want. And um, that was great. My first AGU meeting was in 1983. Uh, of course, was all uh, uh, talks, uh, no posters in, in a small building uh, in the uh, center of San Francisco, not where it is now. And there, where I gave my talk, the room was filled, and I met who is who in hydrology. All the people that I met at that time continue to be and are still friends. Um, I also made some connections and I spent one year at the University of Washington um, during my PhD, although it, my PhD came from the University of Florida. 
Then I spent one year as a postdoctoral um, uh, um, associate at the University of Minnesota, and I was lucky to have a position at Iowa State where both me and my husband in mechanical engineering, we interviewed the same day and we were offered positions the same day. So there is some luck there, uh, but we were prepared, both of us. Um, now, three years later, not that I intended to leave, but University of Minnesota called me back and I always told them, you knew what you were getting. I spent there one year, they knew me well, but they had openings in both civil and mechanical engineering and they invited us. Uh, now, 1989 to 2016 is, and one year before is 27 years at the University of Minnesota. This is a very long time, and I enjoyed every part of that. 2016, I moved to the University of California, Irvine. Of course, I'm still associated with the University of Minnesota as an emeritus professor. So the second take-home message is develop loyalty. Do not move around opportunistically. It is very important to develop, you know, a, a loyalty with the place that you work and you're happy with. Um, and well, 30 years later, it was a good move for me, not only for professionally, but to be in California where my kids were. Um, so that's the other thing. Uh, sticking in a place is wonderful because my kids, um, uh, they were born with, I make a joke, at the University of Minnesota Hospital and Clinic, really two buildings away from my office. And they graduated from the University of Minnesota, both in engineering, uh, refusing to apply anywhere else because Minnesota is the best state in the world. Uh, then they moved to California and we followed them. So my life within AGU and AMS and AGU I was chair of the precipitation committee. I was looking at my resume in 1992. Many of you were not even born, all the young people at that time. Uh, but at that time, um, I'm very happy to see how active you are. At that time, the precipitation committee was organizing sessions, were not sessions solicited by members. They were receiving, accepting, and yes, rejecting abstracts, deciding on speakers, etc. It was basically the um, you know very important uh, or organizing uh, role it was playing. I became fellow of AGU in 1999 and I received different times. I remember that I received an envelope in the mail, which I opened and I was like, wow, you know, do you not know who nominates you or what the process is. And I have been lucky. I, have, I think I have got more awards than I deserve. One thing that I would like to, is, as a joke, to point out is I was looking five years ago at EGU, the European Geophysical Union, that many of you are members of, under the John Dalton medal to see the recent award this. And I said, I've got this medal, but I couldn't find myself anywhere. Later, I realized that it's a separate website because at the time it was not even called EGU, it was called European Geophysical uh, Society, EGS. And it's a separate page. And I hope all of you young people know these names, James Duke, Peter Eglison, Vivian de Marcelli, of course, Keith Bevan. Then 2002 was me. At that time, um, I mean, I didn't know even who nominated me or whatever. And five years uh, ago, looking at that, I found that there was something posted there. It's in the website there. But I was laughing by myself to read that maybe even more remar remarkable than her scientific achievements are her personal traits. A most thorough teacher, colleague, and reviewer to many, but at the same time, a most charming lady. And I said, oh my God, I don't consider myself a charming lady. What are you thinking of? Uh, you know, these days probably that would not even fly well with many people. But um, the other thing they notice there, again, I don't know who wrote it, is how she manages to reconcile her professional duties with her family agendas. And the joke at that time in many years was that if there is an earlier flight, Effie will get into that because I really needed to balance my professional and personal life and my kids. Back to my research, I have worked on probably too many diverse fields over the years. Uh, but uh, precipitation has been something from my PhD research up to now, estimation and prediction. I've worked a lot on landforms, tributary, distributary networks, meandering, predator rivers, and a lot of years in the Midwest on human-dominated landscapes. What ties them together is I've tried to understand the patterns across scales. It, it does use mathematics to improve process understanding, modeling, and prediction. Um, research funding, 
Um, my first NSF award was the Presentation Young Investigator Award in 1988. That's what's called now the career at the time was signed and I have the by George W. Bush, father. Um, the funny thing I want to point out, my, my uh, first NSF regular award, uh, I submitted it to NSF and I get a telephone call that was 89 uh, from someone unknown to me, was a program officer who told me that um, uh, Effie, your proposal was ranked the first. Uh, I want you to send me a budget double of what you ask. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you ask only for 50K, make it 90 to 100. And I said, what can I ask for? He says, that's your problem. Just send me a double budget, <laughs> which was like, wow, these things don't happen these days. Um, but do not close out lightly. Submit only if they are, my saying is 200% ready. Uh, you just don't, you know, throw darts and if they work or not. You put your best. Do not ask for more than you need. I was lucky to be in the NASA pre-trim family, um, 1990, and still I'm very lucky to contribute to GPM. Uh, I have benefited and for many young people, I recommend it to be, if you can, part of larger communities. I was director of an NSF Science and Technology Center, the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics, water sustainability and climate, these are big teams. And uh, if you have good mentorship within them, you can grow a lot. So if you have these opportunities, seek them. Um, and contribute to, com to the community and at St. Fisley. I don't have time to go into that. Many of you know of Kwasi. I was in the, in the, uh, the chair of the board of directors, fought very hard to keep this organization going, wrote the renewal proposal that was 10, 15 years ago. So. Uh, takeaway point, commit yourself to always submit your very best work and be part of the community. And my last slide, words of wisdom, integrity. You have to have in integrity in all you do. Um, strive for excellence in all you do. Personal commitment to scholarship. And uh, you younger people, when I was president of the hydrology section, I created a whole website. I hope you have visited it uh, that has uh, more than 200 papers of the old timers uh, from Langbein to, you know, many people that um, English on and so forth, go and visit it. Read the basics book and the old papers. I was reading myself yesterday, a, a paper of Ed Lawrence uh, written in 1956 before I was born. And he was talking about uh, empirical orthogonal functions and statistical weather prediction. Just go back to the basics. Do not be self-serving. Now, you cannot survive in a community if you ever, uh, you know, um, show that you care about yourself. It's for, for the advancement of the community as a whole. Uh, mentorship and trusted relationships are very important. And um, I hope all of you can establish them uh, in your life because they are um, staying with you forever. Reputation is built event by event and year by year. Uh, and it is important to have. Exciting time ahead for research, I think, for the young people. Climate and the environment will get more attention, I hope. And I'm, um, uh, uh, I hope in the next administration we'll see much more of that. Uh, and combining hydrology, earth sciences, and engineering is essential for solving many of the pressing problems that we uh, face. Uh, so work hard and find your niche. In this broad and competitive arena, it was different. 30 and 20 years ago, it is more competitive, but I am confident that with the hard work, uh, you can find your niche. And I personally am here to mentor and help in any way I can. So I leave you with the be inspired, stay motivated and grow passionate. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Afi. Really a nice presentation. How do I stop sharing? Uh, here. Stop sharing. I think I stopped you. <laughs> good, good. All right. Okay. Thank you. So now we have um, Julia. Let me see. Can I please uh, share mine as well? Okay, sure. Okay. Go ahead. Can you see? Yep. Hi. Um, I'm Giulia Panegrossi and I, I'm, uh, I'm in Italy right now and I work at the Institute of Atmospheric Sciences and Climate uh, in Rome 
Uh, the institute is part of the largest uh, governmental uh, uh, research institution in Italy, which is the CNR, the National Research Council. And ISAC uh, is the largest CNR institute in atmospheric sciences. It's structured in seven units that you can see in this map. Actually, I think I can. Yes. So I'm in Rome, but the headquarters is in Bologna. And I um, and the, the, the institution is a, is a leading institution in remote sensing activities uh, for meteorology and for climate, and also for producing satellite-based algorithms and um, and climate analysis of precipitation. So there has been a long tradition in the ISAC uh, Institute for uh, uh, precipitation uh, um, re related science. Um, so. Oops, not going on. Okay, so uh, I started uh, in Rome where I was born, and I I studied at the Department of Physics at the Sapienza University of Rome, which is the largest uh, university in Europe, and I had very great years in uh, studying physics because I think is the the field that broads your mind and makes you uh, really tackle. Uh, many, many different uh, problems and they uh, change your way of and uh, your attitude to towards solving problems. And then uh, during my studies, I also participated to some field experiments in Greenland. I told tell you later why I did that. And so I traveled, I love traveling and that was a very good motivation for me to do, to pursue the research uh, uh, world and to do, uh, to become a scientist. So, um, and then I moved to work, I uh, started working in the precipitation field uh, when I moved to work uh, with the, through some ESA fellowship at CNR uh, right after my graduation in physics. So as I entered the precipitation world uh, at that time, it was 1994. And then from there, uh, it was the year of the launch of TRIM. I moved to the US uh, to pursue my PhD uh, graduate school in, uh, at UW-Madison uh, at the um, Atmospheric Oceanic Sciences Department uh, in Madison. And there was a great experience. Uh, I ended up staying actually in the US for 11 years. Uh, and then uh, eventually I, I attempted to go back to Italy many times with my family. Um, but once we had a chance in 2004, but then we moved back to the US because it didn't work as we hoped. And then finally uh, we went home for good in 2008. So we flew back to Italy uh, and then uh, I started my life here again. First uh, in L'Aquila, which is a town in the mountain in central Italy. Uh, and then finally I got the position at CNR. So I ended up going back pretty much where I started from. So it was a very complex uh, <laughs> uh, going around, but then ended up going back to where I started and which is a great feeling for me because when I left Italy, I never thought of, of going of living in the US for good. I always hoped to be back one day in my own country. And I when I succeeded, I was I was very happy. So uh, I think that uh, the basic uh, uh, of my studies has always been the connection and the interconnection between modeling and observations. Since uh, when I was uh, in physics, uh, studying uh, uh, in physics, but then when I started working on atmospheric physics, actually during my, my thesis work, uh, which I carried out uh, uh, with Professor Fiocco at the University of Rome and Dr. Fua, I worked on uh, polar stratospheric clouds and I worked on, uh, on a model of polar stratospheric cloud. And that was the year in 1991 when I started working on that when there was this paper from Hamil and Thun uh, finding the connection between uh, polar stratospheric clouds and the ozone hole. So my thesis was basically the modeling of, uh, of building a model, uh, microphysics model of polar stratospheric clouds, and then uh, carrying out measurements uh, with the LIDAR uh, in uh, North, in Greenland, and that's why I went there 
and also the other measurements South Pole, but I didn't end up going to South Pole. I just used the measurements. So the connection between modeling and observation to be able to understand the world that we are living in. And then I moved to the precipitation field in 95, uh, working at CNR with Dr. Alberto Mugnai, who many of you probably know. He was one of the leading, uh, initial leading people uh, in this field, I think, uh, at least from the theoretical point of view, uh, analyzing the, the, um, in detail the, the, the cloud radiation uh, interaction in the microwave and understanding how the hydrometers interact with the passing microwave measurements. And then uh, I moved to Madison. My advisor was uh, Professor Tripoli. I went there through a NASA Earth System Science Graduate Fe Student Fellowship Program that I awarded in 1996. And I moved there with my, we would, we, I just got married a few months before. And then we moved to Madison and we, I started doing my research in hurricane precipitation, mysophysics. And again, the modeling and the observation came together because I was working on a model micro, on the microphysics model uh, and trying to get the right parameterization to match with the first three measurements of what we uh, observed uh, at that time, which was the Hurricane Bonnie. But Hurricane Bonnie was one of the first, I think was the first uh, hurricane that was observed by TRIM. So um, now, uh, currently I'm working on uh, um, different things, but the, my main topics I would say are uh, precipitation retrieval from space, uh, from passive microwave measurements mostly. And I, I, I work a lot with the machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches. Uh, I, I have a lot of uh, interest in snowfall and high latitudes. So here on the right side, we can see a, a, a climatology of snowfall obtained from GMI through a machine learning based algorithms that we developed also with in collaboration with Lisa, with Mark Cooley and with people from the PMM science team. And, uh, and then I work a lot on hydrological applications because I'm involved as a, a science manager in the UMETSAT HSAF, oh, sorry, uh, which is the main, um, I would say, initiative in Europe uh, to for quantitative precipitation estimate from satellites. So uh, I've been involved in this project for since I got into the CNR, so since 2011, and uh, and uh, I think it's uh, it becoming more and more solid right now. And uh, all the research that I carry out is carried out through the collaboration between uh, HSAF and the GPM, and not only, but uh, GPM I would say is the basic of all the research that I carry out right now. Not just just the GPM core, but uh, observatory, but just the GPM idea, the constellation idea. So the the, the passive microwave radiometers and the and the radar. Um, so um, uh, the other uh, very big interest I have is extreme events in the Mediterranean area. So uh, basically, the use of Earth observation for monitoring and characterizing these uh, events that are becoming more and stronger and stronger in our region. And, the, and the, we have uh, worked a lot on the use of GPM for the characterization of these events. We have done some very nice studies on medicaints, right? And we have, this is the latest medicaints we had in uh, September, um, which caused a lot of floods and damages in Greece. And uh, so we have a few very, very beautiful overpass by the GPM, uh, which is capturing the Madigan at its mature phase. And it's the first overpass where the DPR is capturing the, the Madigan in, in its mature phase. So we are looking at this and it's re looking really, really interesting, actually. So about HSAF, I just wanted to mention that we are really focusing on quantitative precipitation estimation because our main goal is to uh, obtain precipitation products that are usable for hydrological application and for near real time applications. So we basically work I, at ISAC, we basically developed all the, the products for the 
constellation radiometers, but then the products that are actually used for the uh, applications are microwave IR precipitation products and uh, microwave base level three products, which are also combined with soil moisture based products uh, um, to obtain uh, a better climatology uh, over land. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that uh, I think that one uh, challenge and one one key uh, topic right now, at least in Europe, uh, is the application of machine learning techniques to precipitation retrieval. So uh, we have been using this for a while. For a while, uh, since 2011, uh, we have developed our own products. But the, but the main challenges are to to apply these uh, techniques to the huge. Uh, um, amounts of data, observational data sets that we can have right now from all the Earth observation um, um, uh, platforms that we uh, can count on. So big data and uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, is really a key element of the future uh, precipitation uh, science. Uh, there are many different methods that have been uh, analyzed, and I think that uh, to work on this uh, could be a good uh, thing. And it's, be, it's looking very promising, especially uh, if um, we manage to deal with the huge amount of observational data set that we have, and we are able to characterize the error associated to that, um, to these uh, observations. Um, so basically, um, I think I've been working on precipitation. Uh, I realized that only while I was preparing this presentation, but I've been working on this field for uh, 25 years, since 1995, when I started working with Alberto Mugnai at CNR. And uh, I came back to work in this precipitation field again uh, lately. So I think that precipitation scientist uh, is a we all know it's a very, very complex uh, topic. Uh, so we it's a broad and deep scientific background is needed. So I think that uh, a strong background, as Effie also was mentioning before, to be to be really uh, critical and to study old papers and to study the basic of science is needed to be able to good science in precipitation. The other lessons I learned is that teamwork works. I would never be able to do anything without working in coll strict collaboration with uh, my Italian colleagues, but also with all my international uh, colleagues and uh, partners in the projects that I work on. Uh, the complementarity, since it's such a complex uh, science, uh, we need complementarity. We need people, experts in the different uh, little details of this huge tasks that we are trying to accomplish to estimate precipitation from space. Um, I think that uh, um, it's very important to look uh, for challenges and opportunities to grow as a good scientist and also especially to grow as a human being and to be a better human being. And uh, I think that uh, uh, promoting the initiatives and collaboration with international partners has always been my key element. Also, when I moved back to Italy, I always try to keep connections with all the people that I knew from the US, from Madison, and also from the Trim era people that I met a long time ago. And so I started connecting with these people again, and I became part of the PMM science team. Uh, and I was very pleased to be back in this uh, nice and great community that we uh, belong to. Um, and also, I would like to stress some challenges. Uh, I would say uh, I would I encourage uh, the, these early career scientists and students to never stop studying and being curious. Always find and solve open questions. And uh, this is an open field. There are a lot of issues to be solved, even though we have been working on this for a while. There are a lot of issues and a lot of open, um, really uh, great gap gaps that we need to fill. 
Um, in Italy, it's very challenging to work because we have to deal with a lot of difficulties to get fundings. It's a, it's a common problem, but in Italy, we don't have any funding from the government. So all the fundings we need to get is from external pro pro projects. Um, of course, um, I would I would just say that uh, um, I think that the big lesson is that uh, it's, it's really a nice to be a scientist, uh, in my opinion, is the best uh, job in the world uh, to, be, to keep studying, to be learning or continuously to 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 keep uh, learning new things every single day is what makes this so special. And precipitation is such a complex topic that really requires you to never stop studying and never stop uh, putting passion in what you do. In what you do. And then finally, uh, I'm very grateful to many people in my life that I met during my whole uh, peregrination throughout the world, but mostly my kids. <laughs> Uh, that I've been, um, I've been traveling, I've been moving them from uh, from the U.S. to Italy when they were little, and it was a very tough uh, decision. But uh, actually, I think we did the right choice. So thank you. Thank you, Julia. Very nice presentation. Now we have last but not least, uh, Mauricio. Um, so I can share again. Or can I share it? Sure. Go ahead. I just want to, uh, since we are running very late, this is our last presentation. Then, if you can stick around for like fifteen more minutes, uh, we we can have a little bit of discussion. That would be great. Um, sorry about this delay, but th those were really really nice presentations. So I didn't have the heart to stop you guys. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I will try to keep short. Uh, thank you very much for the to the technical committee for the invitation and to Viviana Maglioni for getting the the for providing the contact with me. Uh, for me, it's an honor to be here uh, with all these uh, very big names uh, representing the uh, ASU members from the southern hemisphere. My name is Mauricio Zambrano Villarini. I'm associate professor at the University of La Frontera in Chile, and also researcher at the Center for Climate and Resilience Research in Santiago, in the Chile. Uh, in contrast to the previous uh, presentation, uh, I would like to mention that mine has been an unconventional career path and in particular my arrival to the precipitation was quite late uh, because of my life experience I would say I uh, after becoming a civil engineer in 1999 uh, at the University of Concepcion in Chile I worked uh, six years at the Ministry of Public Works in, in Chile, uh, doing hydrological modeling and also in environmental impact assessment. That was not uh, doing science really, but knowing our current limitation. That work experience allowed me to, to get, into, uh, get into the knowledge of how old were the, were the um, methodologies that we were using in Chile at that time for hydrological modeling and uh, how uh, not updated were the environmental regulations that we had in my country. So during that work experience, uh, I decided to, to look for a PhD program. Um, because of my Italian roots, I applied to the University of Trento and I did my PhD there. Uh, mostly in hydrological modeling and optimization. Afterwards, I moved to the to ISPRA, also in Italy, doing a, a postdoc uh, from 2010 up to for three years, uh, mostly developing uh, optimization algorithms for calibrating hydrological models at a continental scale. Then, mostly because of 
uh, family reasons, I decided to come back to Chile. And after a short period at the University of Concepcion, my uh, home uh, university, I moved to the University of uh, La Frontera, where I'm working since then. Uh, and fortunately, in that passage for, uh, for the University of Concepcion, I get in contact with people working at the Center of Climate and Resilience Research. And I had the fortune of uh, joining uh, an interdisciplinary team that uh, has worked with me since then. And during all this latest period since my postdoctoral position until now, I realized that no matter how good all the hydrological models that we were using uh, uh, finally are, uh, we will never be able to obtain a sound hydrological simulation of a stream flow to support decision making if uh, the main uh, driver of uh, hydrological modeling, which is precipitation, is not correct. So I arrived to the precipitation field mostly after failing many times different hydrological simulations in different uh, environments. But uh, for many of you, uh, probably Chile is not uh, well known. So uh, at least for, for me, uh, Chile is not only a, a hot spice, but it's a natural laboratory with a large diversity of landscape uh, for doing uh, research. In particular, here you can see the, in the first uh, panel, you can see the elevations with range from sea level at the Pacific Ocean up to close to 7,000 meters in the Andes mountain range. We also have a very diverse precipitation regime going from almost zero in the Atacama Desert up to almost 7,000 uh, millimeters a year in the southern part of the country. And also from, north, from northern uh, to southern part of, of Chile, we have more than 10 different type of climate in this very narrow strip of uh, continent. What is the University of La Frontera? Uh, this is a small state university located in the southern part of Chile in the Araucanía region. It has 9,000 undergraduate students with several postdoc opportunities for young scientists with solid publication record. Uh, nowadays, it's an open ground for precipitation research because there are a little amount of people working on that field in, in, in Chile in general. And uh, in, in Temuco, in the Araucanía region, in less than one hour, you can reach the Pacific Ocean for a uh, for enjoying a beach day, or a, you can reach the mountain, the Andes mountain range to, if you like a hiking or, or trading. What are some of the challenges that I see in Chile that are very different from, from other uh, sites around the world is that our highly complex topography given mostly by the Andean mountain range, but also for a coastal mountain range close to the Pacific Ocean, gives a very different, a, a very complex topography and development of a climate within these two mountain range. We also have a, a handful of rain gauges in high elevation areas, about 2,000 meters, uh, where most of the precipitation really happens. Uh, we don't have a, a single weather radar uh, available in the whole country. We have applied in the last three years for getting a radar, but we haven't been uh, lucky enough to get funded. And uh, a very challenging uh, aspect of working in Chile is that you have very uh, few good local scientists to collaborate with. But uh, what are some of the opportunities that you have uh, while working in Chile? You have more than 10 different type of climate in a very small territory. So you can try many different techniques and you have a, a challenging landscape to test new precipitation products. 
because in some other countries you have a more or less uniform sort of a climate where a, probably you are not able to test the different capabilities of different precipitation products. We uh, also during the last 10 years, an unprecedented long drought period is affecting Chile, which has translated in, uh, in making all the decision makers and the population uh, becoming aware of how important is a good understanding of precipitation variability uh, or uh, taking sound decisions. Uh, during my work life, I arrived to the conviction that developing countries should not spend a, a lot of money paying licenses when an open source alternative is available. And when the time has arrived, I had to develop some a particular piece of software for developing some, some specific issues. In particular, these four uh, R packages are for management of time series, for the comparison of observations with simulated time series. This is for calibrating any hydrological model using a uh, um, global optimization technique. And this uh, algorithm that was developed with um, Oscar Baez is for merging point observations with one or more different precipitation uh, products. Also in the last uh, year, uh, moved by the need of looking in an easy way to the different precipitation products that are available for our country, um, in collaboration with um, Rodrigo Marinao, we developed this magun, that means precipitation in the indigenous uh, language, this magun precipitation explorer that allows you to easily compare the different precipitation products that are available for Chile and also looking at the comparison of the time series of any of those uh, precipitation products with observations located in different rain gauges. And this has been very useful for pre-selecting different precipitation products before forcing a hydrological model. Uh, recently, we have been testing uh, the latest version of IMER uh, in very different uh, uh, basins from the northern part of the country to the southern part of, of Chile. And we have found that in some places, mostly in the central uh, in the central part of the country and also in the central valley, IMER uh, performs quite well in comparison to observations with some minor problems. But in the northern part of the country, for example, here this line in, in red represents the rain gauge observation while the tiny uh, blue line represents the estimate coming from IMER. Here we can see that for some particular events, IMER fails completely to represent the convective storms that characterize the, the Bolivian winter in this altiplanic uh, high elevation areas. And also in the Patagonia, we have found some problems with, with uh, IMER estimations. And we are trying to analyze what are the reasons and how can we how can we correct this difference in the estimation of precipitation for uh, forcing hydrological simulations. Uh, finally, in order to keep short, uh, and in order to give some piece of advice to the younger scientists attending this uh, meeting, uh, I would like to, to, to give some very few message. And because uh, if, I, if, I, if somebody had questioned me when I graduated from civil engineering, if I would be a, a scientist, for sure, I would have said no, because at that time I didn't have the interest in becoming a scientist. Uh, I wanted to, to work and in particular to work for my country, to be a public uh, servant. 
But however, life has or present you many possibilities. And thanks to all the decisions that I have made so far, um, I'm a scientist now. Uh, and I'm very happy with that, with all those decisions. And some piece of advice for younger uh, people is invest time in knowing yourself. Because if you really know what things makes you happy and what things you really enjoy, for sure, taking decisions will be much easier for you. Discover what you really like to do and go for it. Nobody else is going to do something for you. So if you realize what things are important for you and you don't do it, you will be losing a very important opportunity. Also, talk with wiser, usually older people, about your plans. Uh, because they have much more experience than the one you have now, and uh, it's very likely that they will provide good advice for you. Also, believe in what you do and don't get discouraged, discouraged by others' opinion. Uh, similar to what Effie mentioned, I usually don't take a no for an answer and always try hard to, to prove that something can be done. Also, be honest with everybody. Probably you will have few, but real friends and colleagues. This has uh, made my life much easier than the other people that I know. If you don't feel uh, comfortable in a workplace, do something. In my life experience, I have to quit to several jobs just because when I work it every morning, I wasn't feel uh, very comfortable. And thanks to that decisions, I'm here in a position that I really enjoy. Uh, work hard and be passionate about your work. If you, as uh, the previous presenter also mentioned, uh, being scientist is the best work uh, ever. So if you really find the piece of uh, uh, of science that uh, likes you the most, uh, all your life will be much easier. Uh, keep also national and international connections. Uh, all the, the people that helped me during my PhD and my postdoc, uh, and all the people that I met in different international conferences have been very important for providing new uh, ideas about what are the, the, the important points to be uh, discussed in an article or in a new research line. And finally, but not least important, keep questioning yourself. Am I doing something that makes me happy? Many people, and mostly in this, uh, in this life that moves so quickly, uh, just live uh, without making the important questions to themselves. And for me, every now and then, I try to make me this question to see if I'm in the right place uh, at that moment. Am I doing something that makes me happy? And so far that uh, answer has been yes, at least to me. I hope this will be useful for younger scientists and open to all the questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mauricio. Very nice presentation. So we are running really late here. It's uh, 4.45 Eastern. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry we don't have plenty of time for discussion. We have a quick question here on the chat, so maybe we can answer this one. Um, they said, thank you so much. The talks have been really inspiring. I have a short term quest question. Considering the new world we are living in, what in what are some of the best advices for summer 2021 regarding internship or working with labs? I'm not a NASA uh, finest 
fellow PhD student at Purdue University and working with GPMI Merge, AHPS, and multiple other rainfall sources and hydrology models uh, for hurricane scenarios. Is there a platform available to look for opportunities available? George. So what I have said sort of consistently for like the like last six months is, how are things going to be different at the time that you're talking about? And so what I would suggest is that at, the, at this time frame of next summer, <clears throat> the virus uh, vaccinations will only be coming out and generally available. And so it would not surprise me that most of this is going to end up virtual. Um, so I don't think you should plan to go to labs next summer even. I, at Goddard, I think we will just be getting back ourselves and they're reluctant to plan for students to come when it's uncertain. Okay. That's my, <clears throat> that's an opinion. That's not a, that's not a ruling. Um, there are platforms within NASA and um, we could direct people to uh, within Goddard. There's a particular person that handles things like this, but uh, I think it's going to be ritual. <laughs> So, is there another very quick question, Ralph? Well, I just wanted to also kind of like I, I can I, I know at NOAA there's some opportunities that they have, and again, yeah, like George said, I think I think um, it, it's going to be some kind of virtual thing. But there is something called the Holling Scholarship. I think I, I could probably Lisa can give you that information or. or Person who asked a question can look under the, uh, the Holling Scholarship programs, and, and and the deadline may have may be coming up or could have already passed. But there are some things like that uh, that one could pursue. I see Viviana also shared the quasi um, website for opportunity for students as well in the chat. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of follow up on that um, question for those of you at uh, NOAA or NASA, um, are the, you know, kind of typical postdocs still going to come out as, as scheduled or are those being frozen? Wow, what a good question. Uh, <laughs> uh, like I said, there are... I would I would look for the the standard like the NPP opportunity on the website and contact them you know the, the contact person um, if you can't find that um, work through us and we'll we'll figure out who to talk to. Thanks. Yeah, so Ralph shared the NOAA website for the scholarship. Thanks. You know, the, the other thing is that um, lots of agencies like NSF, for example, have supplements to existing grants uh, because students have not been as productive or postdocs. So uh, if, if you have someone in mind you want to work with and they have an NSF grant, probably you can approach them and see if they can ask for a supplement uh, for such an opportunity. Right, and here comes the importance of making connections and meeting people and talk and uh, you know share your interests and see if you meet the right person at the right moment. Usually, that's how it works. Actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> what I tell my students is, no, nobody will hire you because he liked your resume. Right. Usually, they have to know you before. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, at least that that how it worked for me. So I. Uh, that's also my experience. Are there other questions? You can unmute yourself. Well, I, I want also to thank everybody for the patience and uh, I, I, I think this was really great and very interesting and uh, gave a lot of uh, inspiration and uh, made think about opportunities and yeah, possibilities. So thank you to all the speakers for their 
for their availability and uh, their help with this. Sure. sure. Thank you for organizing. Are all the um, all the committees as active as you guys? I don't think so. <laughs> That's great. We are the best. You're the best. I know you're the best. And when I was the president, there was a discussion of, oh, there are so many committees. Should we uh, dismantle them? And I said, no, we have to repurpose them. For example, they were, if you remember, there were sessions proposed by two different people on the same topic, not knowing that they want to propose the same session or the other. And we provided the mechanism to kind of connect these people before they submit sessions. So I'm glad to see you are doing great. Thank yeah, you. One of those was actually Water and Society. They just created uh, exactly with the process that you described, Effie. Yeah, which yeah. is an interesting one. But I have to say that I feel like the, the young scientists or the early career scientists uh, in our group have been very active uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I really like it. So thank you guys uh, for yeah, doing what you're reason, doing. If, even the, the um, what is it, a young scientist in hydrology? I remember the name of the person that uh, we created it and then the other se se sections followed. So everything I was used to talk, everything starts from hydrology. You know? <laughs> That's good. All right, guys. So uh, again, I thank you very much. There will be this happy hour uh, that I we, we set up for actually make connections. So if you still have questions or you want to yeah. keep in touch and just, you know, connect for a few minutes, ask something or suggest something, uh, something is not clear about AGU sessions or whatever you want to ask. We will put you, maybe we won't know the answers, but we can put you in touch with uh, with someone that could know. So that's a good possibility for us all to know each other and, uh, you know, get the answers we need. Any final comment, Viviana? I'm very happy. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. <laughs> I think it went great. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's always inspiring to, to learn from uh, our senior colleagues uh, and very successful colleagues. So, so I, I think it was, uh, it was great. And I hope it was inspiring to you guys at, at, as it was to me. Thank you. Thanks. So don't forget to fill the form, the survey. We, we can post it in the chat again. The link it will be very useful for us since this was the first event to know how we did, what we can improve for sure a lot and uh, what we, you were expecting or stuff like that. A normal survey. No. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Have Bye. a good night, Have day, a good one. evening, Bye -bye. afternoon, whatever. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.